Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 364 for Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022. And welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor today is a new sponsor for us. It is Masterclass. We're at masterclass.com slash gig gab. You can give one membership and get one for free. We'll talk more in depth about that a little bit later. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. How are we today, Mr. Kent? Good. Thanksgiving week, my man. It is. Yeah, we have a lot to be thankful for this year. Yet another Without year of gig gab. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming up we're coming on eight or nine years. It, it's coming up on eight years. Yeah, it'll be eight years in February. I think it's February. I want to say February 9th, but that, then as soon as I say that date, I think February 9th, 1964, that's the day the Beatles played on Ed Sullivan. So I don't yeah. think it's February 9th for us because we would have noticed that over the years. We have one more thing to be thankful for today. In a recent episode, we were talking about the people that can help your band sound, look, and be better than your band uh, is, or at least to realize the full potential of your band. And I made a comment, everybody needs a Davis. And I was talking about Davis Thurston, who here on the New Hampshire seacoast and beyond is, uh, I, I met Davis as a sound engineer he has expanded his repertoire, including doing lights and multi-camera video streams all at once. Uh, and we are very fortunate and thankful to have Davis Thurston here with us on the show today. Thanks for joining us, Davis. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. It's good to have you here. So did I miss anything in the intro of, of, of all the stuff that you do when you're when you're at gigs? Because that's a lot. That's that's the bulk of it. Uh, I end up taking pictures, uh, multi-track <laughs> recording and archiving. Uh, I do a little running around sometimes when requested. Um, sure. I definitely have a, a, a rigging background and a pretty extensive lighting background. So sometimes that comes into play. Sure. Sometimes somebody comes up and says, we're going to do something. And I, Let me look at it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It, you were you, I mean, you have these backgrounds. Did, were you formally trained, or was this just stuff you learned sort of on the fly, or uh, over the years in various professional environments? Yeah. Uh, music hall uh, took me in early on. Uh, taught me a lot of hemp rope rigging styles. God. I worked with uh, Quentin Stockwell and John yeah. Morris, and uh, we did tons and tons of shows. Uh, I learned all about drops and drapes and bench focusing ellipsoidals, and you know, doing all the fun theatrical stuff. How to distribute power, you know, all the different flavors of power, stage pin, EtherCon, you know, yeah. EP4, which gets used for audio a lot in okay. some of the bigger systems. Um, now you sound like you're a technical guy by trade, though. Like you're, you're comfortable with a lot of the kind of like more engineering aspects of what you do. Is that right? That, that's, that's correct. I, I um, have been a hobbyist uh, musician for most of my life, and that just naturally turns to gear nerding out and learning about mixers and how to put together things like and what then, we do here. And then eventually you're, <laughs> you're mixing for things and then you're mixing for bigger things and you're like, huh, I didn't realize this was a career. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. And you're a, 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 a bass player primarily as a, it, it, you're, you're the musical yeah. side, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I started out as bass player, um, picked up guitar, picked up some key skills, uh, programming, stuff like that. Nice. Um, never really got good at drums, but I have a drum set, so I still try. There you go. Hey, that's what I do. I have a drum set. I try. It's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Davis and I met years ago. In fact, we were just talking about that. I, I think the first place we met was when you did sound for fling at the stone church, probably six or seven, maybe even eight years ago now. Yeah, I don't sounds know. Like about right. COVID strain changed our perception of time, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, we were saying you were the first one to make me sing into an M80, uh, which sounds great with some singers. I don't know. I, it sounds great with most singers. Vocal technique on an M80 is an acquired taste. 100%. Yeah. The the reason I picked them up is because the Stone Church is such a difficult room to to clean up and sound good and get the vocals to cut across to not be too For sure. insane and 58s really don't work oh, no. very well in there. So no, 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 you can't you, use a You need something more yeah. super cardioid and um, high gain. Yeah. Um OM7 could have could have been a good oh, choice for me, yeah. but I just I, I didn't lean into the the Audix world as much. Sure. 
And yeah. I got a set of M80s and I was like, wow, I can get what I want. I can don't dial down that crispness or I can leave it. Um, and the more I tour around with it, the, the, the better of a knife it is. Yeah. Because sometimes you end up with a, a, a band like PTF that's spread across the stage and they end up right under the arrays. And, oh, and it's, you, know, <laughs> so oh, yeah. you end up into the, un, in, under the gun a little bit sometimes and yep. you don't realize how tight some of these rooms are going to get, it, especially when, when we load in such a crazy uh, lighting rig behind us. Got it. Oh, that makes sense. So, okay. Davis, you are, uh, you're for hire for whoever wants to hire you. you. You do cover bands, you do touring bands, you do original music. Do you have many regular groups that, uh, that you're kind of, more or less on retainer with these groups to be available when they need you? Um, not, nothing full retainer yet, but I, I definitely work with a lot of groups closely. Um, uh, the, the big one that just got birthed out of the seacoast during the pandemic is Marble Eyes, and uh, that, that hooked me up with Eric Gould, uh, hooked me up with Pink Talking Fish, oh, that hooked so me up you, with Neighbor. You weren't yeah. working with Pink Talking Fish before. Marble Eyes nope. was your entrance into that world. Yep. Interesting. Yep. We had Dave Brunyak, uh, who was the guitar player with Pink mm -hmm. Talking Fish for a stint on the show a number of years ago. Yep. So the listeners know about, about yep. that band. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The founding guy. Uh, I remember mixing him with Zach at, uh, uh, and Jody uh, at the, the Stone Church for, for years as the Freaks. As the Freaks. Yep. Right. And uh, right. I remember when that, that happened and they got you know, you know absorbed in and I was like, wow, now that band is going to nail. You yeah. Know, like, and they did. Because you're, you're picking three bands that are hard to hate by anybody. And then you put them all together in such creative ways that nobody sees it coming. I yeah. mean, the crowd is literally blown away every time they come up with new combinations. And yeah. I, I, some of the stuff they've done even in the last couple of weeks has blown me away. And I'm that's just like, great. wow. How, you're there for most yeah. of the shows. Oh yeah. I'm like, I get, I'm, I get to do this every night. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That's cool. All right. So I, I, I want to, I, I, we're definitely going to get into this multi-cam video streaming thing mm -hmm. uh, because to me, that is not only magic, uh, and we're going to sort of try and, and dissect the magic a little bit, but I think it's it's really something that bands can use if they can use it to level up their game. And you know, we talked recently on an episode, Paul and I had a conversation after I saw Goose and it was like, okay, how did they how did they like move ahead so quickly? And you and I even had this conversation about how they, you know, they were doing multi-cam video shots at crappy clubs all over the country that couldn't like the, 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 the nightly net from that couldn't possibly have sustained it. And yet they were able to fund it and do it. We, you know, we, our, our dissection was that goose treated the band like a startup mm -hmm. and just, you know, raised money probably from family members, but who knows? And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then just spent the money to get to where they needed to be. And it, it, for, for at least for them, it worked, but I want to, I want to kind of go back to, the start of it, because I think you have from your position behind the soundboard and, and not just behind the soundboard, but getting everybody set up and, you know, rolling and all that stuff. How I'm, I'm curious how you approach a gig with a, a just, you know, from the sound perspective, how do you approach a, a gig with a new band versus a band, you know, and, and then what would you love to get from every band you work with new band or, or existing band? Like what, how, how can they get in your good graces and, and in, inspire you to go above and beyond? And I, I know that you go above and beyond anyway, cause you care about your work, but you know, what are the things that a band can do to either turn you on or turn you off? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, obviously the, the first piece of, any production is in advance. Um, and sometimes you get nothing from a band and you're totally surprised by what happens on the stage. Uh, and that can be just as much fun as having all the plan in the world and then having it not come true. You know what Fair. I mean? So I've seen a lot of, here's, here's your advance. You build the stage, they get there and they're like, no, 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 no. That was last year. Or that's when we tour with this guy. And it's <sighs> like it, the amount of times that the agency gets wires crossed with the band and the the actual advanced materials you get are not correct is so rampant that I don't want to see stage plots anymore because they're never correct. I'd rather just react on the fly because I'm that, I, I can go that fast and I can juggle. Yeah. It. Well, you've had to, you've, you've had yeah. to learn how to do it. So, okay. So a, if lot of, a lot of sound guys love to see the paperwork because they love to have something to be pragmatic to and stick the band to and be like, no, no, you sent me this, like, this yep. is what we're doing. And it's like, no, nah, the band's going to roll in and, and roll you right and, over. So. And yeah, the band needs, 
needs yeah. to you need to serve the band. Now it should hopefully be a two way street. Oh but, yeah, but no, it's, it's a what you would you like fries with that industry? So yes, you know. yeah, okay. So but I, so if a band is going to put uh, an advance together. A, get it right, and B, put a date on it mm -hmm. to perhaps communicate to the more seasoned engineers like you that mm -hmm. actually this is accurate. This isn't from two years ago. You know, this isn't pre-COVID. <laughs> and also an updated contact that they can get directly in contact with somebody who's in the van traveling with the band and be like, hey, are you guys having a guest tonight? You know, mm -hmm. are you having five guests tonight? Are you sharing everything with the opening band because they're your college friends? You know, like little things like we're going to do two drum sets tonight because this guy never shares his kit. Sure. Are huge things when you're talking about a small stage, especially yep. like a 12 by 16, which is what a lot of clubs afford. Yeah. And you had 12 by 16 with two drum sets. Forget about it, especially if you have a big keyboard rig as well. Interesting. So it becomes a, a problem. And usually, especially at the Stone Church, places like that or the press room, you end up. Um, trying to convince the bands to share a drum kit just for sanity. For sa like, oh, for just, sanity just reasons. Please, Absolutely. please. This is yeah. going to get so crazy. Yeah. Me having to well, and your and, and your changeover now is goes from you know twenty five minutes to fifty five minutes yep. if you're lucky. Well, that's that that's the argument is that hey, if you guys share stuff, I can get you more time on stage. Yep. And if I'm recording and doing video, then that means more content. So um, everyone's like, well, yeah, whatever you want, man. Uh, <laughs> we just want to get yeah, this get it rolling, get it good. You know. Yeah. 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 All right. Hey, you know, we've been talking about wanting to learn lots of things on this show, and one of them was songwriting. Paul, I looked into our sponsor masterclass here and found a course on songwriting taught by John Legend. And it's it's amazing how deep it goes, how quickly it goes. And what's cool is you don't have to just sit down and, like, absorb the entire class at once. They carve out lessons that are approximately 10 to 15 minutes in length so that you can find the time to do these things. And in addition to video lessons, Masterclass provides you with downloadable lesson recaps, supplemental materials. For, for like Gordon Ramsay teaches cooking, for example, another great class to dig into. And it comes with beautiful downloadable guides that are at the level of a high-end cookbook. The classes are cinema quality. They give you unparalleled access to these world-renowned instructors sessions a, a new product from masterclass allows for deeper dives into the lessons over a month-long period sessions include projects to submit to a teaching assistant for feedback as well as the opportunity to learn alongside a community of peers it's really cool there's so many things you can do i highly recommend you check it out this holiday you can give one annual membership and get one free Go to masterclass.com slash giggab today. That's masterclass.com slash giggab. Terms apply. And our thanks to Masterclass for sponsoring this episode. So, Davis, I'm fascinated by this multi-camera shooting stuff. So t take us through the rig. You know, how many cameras? What do you use to mix? What do you use to send it out? Do you do advanced work? Checking out the internet connection at the various venues you might be at. So, Go soup to nuts on what happens when you're gonna gonna do a multicam. Okay, yeah. Um, obviously, a hardwired internet connection producing something like 12 to 15 me megabytes up is necessary to produce a proper 1080 stream and get it out without dropping packets. Yep. Um, you want a little bit of buffer room, and usually 10 to 11 actually gets full 1080 out. Um, if it's less than that, what I'll do is I'll run two decks, and I'll use one to scale and one to um, mix and record uh, at full at full 1080, no matter what. Um, I run. Yeah. So what? What when when you're like what what decks are you using? What cameras are you using? What software are oh, yeah, you using? Yeah. Like what's the yeah? What yeah. is that? Yeah. So I I bought into the early in the pandemic. The Atom, um, sorry, Black Magic released the Atom series uh, and the minis. I'm sorry, the minis, um, which could stream and record uh, multiple HDMI sources at once and ISO record them. So I got one little four four channel ones um, under a grand, not okay. not too bad. Yeah. Um, and I and I got some GoPros, and I just wanted to see if it was worth it, if I could do it. So yeah, and that was so, the, the the. So I bought uh, four GoPro th Hero threes, just you know, yeah. fifty dollar used, you know, nothings, and hardwired them, hard battery, you know, hard powered them. Okay. So don't deal, don't ever deal with the batteries, you know, hard hard, hard everything. Don't yeah. don't deal with Wi Fi because you'll always have dropouts and pixelation and stuff. Always hard hardwire everything. 
Um, and then it was all a game of figuring out how long of a cable length you could power HDMI wise off of that small of a video card. So that, that little brain can only power so many HDMI sources at such, uh, you know, whatever. So I, so I sat in a hotel room doing a theater gig up in Plymouth for a week and just tested every cable combination. I had, uh, uh, SD, black magic SDI, uh, HDMI converters. I got a couple of network box converters and stuff like that. And just see see what worked hundreds of hundreds of feet of cable, 50 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. Yeah. Tested every single combination. I found that input one on the four channel, uh, atoms is stronger than two, three, and four. So it will power a GoPro at 30 feet, but number two, three, and four will not do much more than six or seven feet. What? Yeah. So it's a little does, bit. Does Black like, Magic know about this? I don't know. All right. Well, they'll know after because we, we know the folks at Black Magic. So, so they're going to find out. So, Uh-oh. but, but no, no, that's a good thing. Like this is what they want to hear about. So, right. So, yeah, so this when is I, good. when I got the uh, larger one, I got the Atom Extreme, which uh, I did not get the ISO one. So it does not ISO record all eight. That was still under a grand. Um, because I got it a couple of years later and um, number inputs one and two are stronger than three, four, five, and six, seven, and eight. Um, <laughs> and it cascades down by the time you get to seven and eight, they're, they're significantly weaker. Huh. Um, so it was an interesting game, but that aside, I, in order to run those, you need to have some type of computer controller. I bought a cheap, uh, throwaway touchscreen PC, and uh, and I run the ADM control software on that, so I can I can put the deck wherever I want, and I can control it from wherever I want, oh. and that's the whole thing is like being oh. able to run your macros, run your switches all off of a touchscreen, so you don't have to sit there with a mouse in the dark. In the, well, know, also right. while you might be mixing sound and yep. perhaps lights and yep. everything else. Yep. So touchscreen, um, throwaway PC. <sighs> That is the that is the the money when you're when you're running one of these things makes sense. Um, so in any case, uh, I eventually noticed that you know GoPros look good in daylight, and we were doing a lot of outdoor daylight shows during the pandemic, and great, great, great. But once you get into low light situations, they bit crash like crazy. They don't look good. They can't yep. keep up with the contrast. Um, all those things, shutter speed, whatever. Um, so I started buying better cameras, and I first got uh, got turned on to. Um, Panasonic's uh, sister brand Lumix, and I bought some G7s, and they look great for a cheap, uh, you know, not feature laden camera. It's all I want is something that I can power and run signal out of, and it's a micro four thirds 4K sensor, so it looks pretty damn good run into a 1080 machine. Um, it has bits to lose, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, and those tend to look really good, and you can stop them down. Um, when you have a, you know, a, uh, lighting situation that is very light to dark fast like strobing and high energy yeah they can freak out a little bit because they, they have a hard time figuring out what they're looking at sure um so as a new to the video world person i'm still trying to iron some of those bugs out but for the most part um the shoots come out pretty good at this point i have seven g7s oh, wow. and i and i typically do seven and eight camera shoots and wow. um it works out great i you know you figure out which lengths you can run and because those are l- slightly larger body cameras they yeah. actually will power a large l- longer cable run because oh. the video card is stronger because they are participating in this equation absolutely so i've found that i can get 30 feet and 20 feet out of one through four or even five and six without having to run a bunch of converters, which is awesome. Cause then I put my, my deck right on stage do all my tight shots really close and then network control that from back of house. And then I send an, uh, a look, a look line, my screen line so I can yeah. see what's going on. And then I send uh, a camera line back. So I ended up, dude. With, this is amazing. So I end up with four network runs because one's got to be a digital snake too for my audio. For the audio, right? So, so it ends up with four total digital runs, and I all the game I've played with HD SDI. It's it's great. The cable's great. Standard's great, but not all the houses have it. Most houses have network. Oh. So what I found is that I got into the HD SDI game, and then I found that more places are network friendly, and I'm better off having network because it's cheaper and more throwaway, and you can get it. You know, I can go to whatever store locally and grab a bundle of uh, of Cat Five and yeah. ma- make my video happen. And you're golden, yeah, right. Uh, SD, oh, I, I have to ask some deconstructing questions because this it's is insane. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So, Ben wants to hire you. You you have basically three or four lines of service that you can do. You can do sound for him. You can do lights for him. You can do video shoots for him. 
Is that about it? Three three lines of service. <laughs> is that is that all, David? No, no, no. no, no. I'm, I'm actually going to get to. I'm actually going to get to an interesting place. Is, is that accurate? Those are the three things someone can buy from you, right? Yeah. Well, I, I also do multi track recording, and if you're going to do shoot okay. shoot for video, you need to have the multi track so that you can fix any aberrations after. People will watch a great video with, I mean, a crappy video with great audio, yeah. but they will not watch a good video with crappy audio. No, you have to have right, great right, right. audio. So no, you, that's a key point to take to away, it. folks. I yeah. might. I might be able to do a good mix every time, but I can't guarantee that. I might get sick. I might be, um, you know, five, six days deep on a hundred decibel rooms and my ears just aren't what they should be. And I, you know, things start to fall off and quality is not going to be guaranteed. So, so I, that's my, it's way. No, 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 I, I want to put, put your question on, on pause for a second. Cause I, I want to get into the, the, what you just talked about here, Davis, the, you are mixing audio, f- op, perhaps not obviously for front of house for the room, Probably also mixing monitors or in-ears for the band. That's correct. Or yeah. maybe they're doing it. But then also, and I want to talk about in-ears. We'll get there, folks. Trust me. Our listeners know we're <laughs> obsessed with this. Uh, but then you're also doing a separate bus mix for the people listening to the streamed video, either in real time or or you know after yep. the fact. Yep, okay, that's correct. I, for the longest time, I've always done a broadcast. What I call what I call the now broadcast a broadcast mix. mix. Yeah. But even right. back in the day at the Stone Church, I would be like, I want to get a better recording than the left right will, will sound. So I'd use one of the, the auxes, even on the old analog boards, and I just kind of like fidget it around and you know stick the headphones on and get down on my knees and try to try to figure out what's going on and. Over years and years and years of doing that, you get a little bit better. better and you can, sure. oh, once once you can hear the kick drums too much, once the, once you can hear the vocals, they're towering. So there's like all these little things, tricks that, that you know. If you're in a hundred decibel environment, trying to also pummel yourself in, with cans, it's it, it's it's fraught with danger. You're not going to yeah. necessarily nail it every time. Well, that's um, why often if somebody's doing that kind of thing, there is literally a truck outside yep. the venue yep. where they can <laughs> isolate themselves and all that good stuff. But you don't get to do that if you're mixing front of house i do uh actually because i use a wireless in-ear pack for my pfl so i walk right outside the venue sometimes on the other side of brick walls and i mix yeah. the broadcast because it, if it's that mission critical sometimes i'll have, I'll have, I'll have to Makes do that sense. especially during sound check i can dial it way in by leaving the room right so, oh, so that's so, smart all right so paul yeah thank you for this. Just, st- yeah. stick with me here because what i'm getting getting to we're going to deconstruct this is like is your model the model for the modern sound man like 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 i don't know someone who does all of what you do so like if someone hires you like if, do you bring your own sound gear when you when you're hired to do sound is it your gear or do you what just walk in and, and mix on someone else's gear usually i never mix on the house gear I, i've learned okay. over the years not to trust it i'm fast no, no, i get my it gear bringing my program for my band is just right out of the box but you are sound mixing on often on house speakers right like if the house oh, yeah. has a raised setup or something Absolutely. so it's, it's a blend of the houses yeah, yeah. you got it i Re- travel with my own mics sure. uh, usually i travel with my own mic cable just because it's faster i trust it and it's less to have to chase yeah um and you know obviously travel with all my own video and video cable because nobody has that um and how big is your 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 posse of crew that you will call on if you get called to do a gig and someone wants everything someone wants someone wants sound lights you know and a streaming show um i typically show up and do it myself this is blowing my mind. This is why I wanted to have Davis on the show. I know I'm looking this at all is this. Literally like, blowing my mind. Paul, this is why I said every band needs a Davis. Like this is it. Amazing. Yeah. I find. All right. Well. All right. No, sorry. You go, no, you go ahead. I, I'm going to let my mind settle back into this this concept. <laughs> well, one the guy the, the lighting thing is is an interesting game because when you understand the DMX world and what's going on, and these lights are just taking pulses of uh, coded electrical signal from the brain thing. It's and it's all just like this language communication gar- game. It's not that complicated. You you just get in there and you're like, okay, what's the profile for this light? It's a eight channel light. Okay, so channel one, two, and three, and four are probably just the colors. You know, red, green, blue and amber maybe or maybe white or uv um and then the other four are probably macros and speed of macros and then master dimmer and you know things like that sure um so just figuring out what they do and then getting that programmed into whatever you're using is the hardest part doing lights is fun i was going to talk about this because the waiting is the hardest part guys the waiting (laughs) is the hardest part (laughs) but my question is like if we were to just break this down and get away from the 
the technical acuity. There's, then there's the artistic acuity. And lights are actually, they're really interesting to me because most semi-professional bands look horrible lit. I mean, you get these candy-colored lights that are kind of on for a long time or they blink or whatever it is, and, it, and it's, it's absolutely horrible. Are you telling me that like the, the light lighting director chops, like w you got those from just working with other people or experimenting or looking at what other bands do and saying, I'm going to adopt that? Uh, lighting in particular is a is a bone pick thing for me. I mean, you can get a lot of people to run sound for you, but it's actually hard to find for bands to find like creative lighting people because most semi professional bands, like I said, they have candy colored lights on them all all night long. Sometimes they blink, sometimes they don't, and it's it's actually worse than anything else. So, talk a little <laughs> bit about lighting. I think that uh, a lot of what you're describing is when um, bands end up without an, a lighting person and the, the house sound guy or maybe they're just DJ lights in the club um, are just set to sound chase. And uh, that that to me is appalling yep. as well. I think that's horrible. You need to, if you're going to put on entertainment at any level, you need to pay attention to all aspects of entertainment. And concerts are very much a visual medium and when you when you intend on having a hundred people or more a night watching a band, you need to put a little work into it, especially mm. when it, some of these lights aren't that expensive anymore. The, the stuff coming out of China now is insane and and looks good and is easy to program. And you're like, huh? I didn't. I mean, that used to cost twenty thousand dollars. Now it costs three. Right. Yeah. So yep. there's a little bit of that bottom dropout. Uh, same thing with the video world. I wouldn't have gotten into it five years ago. Uh, a switcher setup would have been twenty thousand dollars and I, what i have cameras and all is under five so that's amazing okay yeah. that that's that's a takeaway folks right like to to up your band's game now you still need to figure out how you're going to run this or who's going to run this but you could even set up fixed cameras and mix it after the fact like if mm -hmm. you don't have someone that can mix it live and and create your you know your live stream you could still the next day release your own live stream what it means is after you pack your crap up and you go home now you have to stay up for two and a half hours and mix a video but hey look if if you want to propel your band forward putting fresh high quality content on youtube and anywhere else every time you play a show is going to make a difference. Like this is what feeds Google's algorithm. It's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe us, listen back to the episode we talked about with goose. It like mm -hmm. it makes, and even PTF pink talking mm -hmm. fish, mm -hmm. it, like a huge amount of their success has come from people seeing them on video and then saying, Holy crap, I want to go see that live. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, I've been shooting every show i've done for them for the last two years and they've they're, they've we're sitting on some serious content and they'll yeah. release a couple videos here and there they're very, they're very smart about it and they wait they wait until it, it's good to you know dump the next thing and yep. uh you know pick some of the more creative transitions that they've come up with and and push those forward that's and, true you don't have to go home and mix the two and a half hour mm -hmm. show you know what was good musically mm -hmm. Go see what that looks like on the cameras yep. and mix it together. Spend Absolutely. an hour doing, you know, one song or a two song transition, like you're saying, put that out. And now you've just wet people's appetites. Yep. I've gotten asked multiple times while on tour, you know, we got four hours in the car to the next venue. He's like, yeah. hey, can you grab the this song from last night? And maybe we'll, maybe we'll put it up and, you know, whoever relics or whoever will grab it and jam bass will grab it. And it's like, well, this is going to sell some tickets and like, it's so gonna this, sell this. to the next show. And now like everybody in real helped. time, everybody has helped. Yeah. The venue gets more, more sales. They get more, more merch happens, you know, um, and everything. your band is more like you are making your band more than just what happens on stage. Larger I, than life. Larger than life. That's mm -hmm. it. And you know, we've always done this, especially with original bands, but like all of this applies to cover bands and tribute bands and all of that stuff. You know, there's always the, okay, well record a record, release the record that makes you larger than your stage show. Great. That's fine. But in today's world, people see things, they want to watch stuff. And if you can give them, you know, five minutes of something freaking huge mm -hmm. it's huge and, and there's also a there's a there's a there's a sweet spot there uh we'll record uh two hour shows and three hour shows and um 
sometimes the bands are just like, oh, this the whole show was good. Let's just put the whole thing up. I'm like, no, no, no. no you no. put the whole thing up five years from now. Right. You know what I mean? You put up one song to this month, one song three months from now, one song six months from now, and you tease it in there, and then you'd be like, this is that whole show. You've already seen all the pieces, but now we're going to give you a whole presentation. It gives way more... Uh, moments of interaction with your audience and that's what the, the whole world is screaming for right now they want you to be able to have new content constantly right and if you're a band that's only playing three or four shows a month and you're dumping the whole setup every time it's like oh you're not leaving anything to to be desired yeah. uh, and there's a certain po- percentage of people who aren't going to watch a 90 minute set on their phone i would say there's a sizable percentage of people mm. in fact the vast majority of people are not going to watch a 90 minute set on their phone, but when or they're less doom- than a minute, what? less than a minute <laughs> when they're doom scrolling, you know, and they come across something that's not so doom filled, they might spend that minute and be like, Hey, and now not only do they remember it, but subconsciously it registers as this thing that was pleasant in the midst of, you know, the freaking disaster that is whatever <laughs> yeah. social media platform you choose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I got to ask the question because I know what I see from the stage, but you've got seven cameras. How many shows have you done full, full, you know, video production for? Uh, Round. I got my hundred. I got my first deck in uh, late, uh, early twenty, uh, and I started shooting right away. Um, I'd say we're at. 200 shows at least amazing all right so like i said i know what i see from the stage but you've got seven cameras around what is the weirdest thing that you've got on video that you like should i should i put that out should i should i eat that one or should i let the world see what just happened Oh, I've I've definitely uh, done a couple acts, and I, I will not name names because it's not fair. Uh, but I I did a, a full festival at Strange Creek uh, this year, and everyone's gone to Strange Creek over the years. Camp Kiwani. I did the Riverworm stage, which is like way out in the woods, uh, and some some pretty crunchy acts, some pretty good acts. Uh, Marbleize was on that stage. You know, some people really left it left it all on the stage. That's right. But there was one act that just I I I still watch that video and just laugh. <laughs> Because it was so bad. And like, I can't describe because I don't want to hate on people or types sure. of music or nothing like that. Sure. But it was one of those where you're like, I can't believe these people do this and pat themselves on the back afterwards. But at the same time, to each his own, you know, people were getting down. It's what it is. But I've seen some embarrassing things in, in that in that realm, you know, like uh, when you mix bands who are really doing excellent jobs covering certain songs and then you see a band just completely destroy the song. You're like, huh. Well, that Not is, a, dude, you're giving me like a, like a very interesting <laughs> technical answer, but I'm going to actually ask the question in different way. Like, I'm thinking, you know, David, I often talk about people behaving badly, people crashing the stage, diving on the stage. I mean, oh. you must have some good story of some oh. absolutely weird thing. Oh, of course. Uh, one of the one of the famous gigs that I've had for for a long time, um, this almost started my business uh, was um my guitar player uh, in the in the ride, uh, Jesse, his his brother Jake went to Tuck, and he would uh, and have me up to put together some you know bits and pieces, sound gear, and kind of make something happen. And the band would play, and it turned into this whole thing. And now it's like a Tuck band, and every year they do it, and they get bigger, and it's this whole thing. And we just we pack these rooms, and they do they 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 play at the, the Winter Carnival, which is like the whole. Um, uh, ski competition that Dartmouth yeah. does with everybody, and and it's like a big thing. And I mean, these kids party. I mean, we're talking crowd <laughs> surfing, people chucking beers at the stage. You wouldn't believe the amount of debauchery that goes on up there. But at the no, same we, time, we would believe it. But yeah. at the same time, and you got it all on video. It's, well, no, I don't actually video those. We we do audio recordings for those only. I uh, I, I got into video recently, and yeah. Um, but no, those, those gigs have always been the most handful. Cause I'll go home stinking of beer because there was just so much on my cables and <laughs> I've been pulled over before on the way home. And there, the guy pulls me out. He's like, you stink. And he's like, gets me to walk the line, the whole thing. And he's like, what's well, so tell me what's going on here. And I'm like, all right, I came from a gig. Uh, everyone's just, it, the stage is just a puddle of beer. All my shits, you know, like this is, this is what's up. That's what's and, up. And, and you know, the guy's like, huh? Well, you're not drunk, so go home. I'm like, yep. great. Yep. <laughs> Take a I've, shower. I've, I've, yep. I've run in. I've had those conversations on the way. I think we probably all have. It's 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 it's, it's five a.m. driving on the highway. Exactly. This, They're gonna pull yeah. you over. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I think I'm. It, well, maybe a band has asked, but I, it, having a camera on stage 
facing, showing what the band sees of the crowd would likely lead to some very entertaining outtakes, perhaps only for the green room and never for public consumption. I typically set up a crowd cam because okay. I like to put that up and then stuff uh, like the, the lead guitar just ghosted on top of it. Oh, so it's yeah. just like a sea of people yeah. and then him, him on top or her, whatever. You know, whatever. Sure. Whoever's is. taking the lead. Yeah. And, and, and that, that I think really works great, but yeah, you don't want to just sit there and shoot the crowd. Like, no, I, well I, you do. I mean, remember that's <laughs> from your time on stage, you know, that's our view all night long. And some of the things that I've seen, we've talked about some of them on the show. Some of them, we will only ever talk about during the pre-show or post-show because it's just not appropriate to share those stories. But like those I, th- years ago, before GoPros ever existed, I remember being at a gig. This was in Austin, so it must have been, you know, 1997 maybe. So like there was no technology that would exist for me to like clamp a camera on my drum kit. But I desperately wanted to because I was playing these gigs with this mm-hmm. blues band. And just what people would do. It's like, you know, the fourth wall isn't actually... A wall, folks. A wall. <laughs> like we, we can see you. You just like you can see us. You know, you're you're 20 feet away. Like I can see everything about what you're doing, and that's disgusting. You know, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that in public. Maybe not even in private, but certainly not in public. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, the behavior game is wild. Uh, I live in yeah. a in an environment where I'm always at the party, but I'm not necessarily part of the party. You know, right? Uh, right. I, I love craft beer, and you know, I'll have I'll have a couple beers during the during the show or whatever. But I'm never like beyond my faculties. You sure, know? I got too many buttons to push. I got touch screens. I'm running. I'm running people's ears. It's just too much happening. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, it's never it never gets that far. Uh, but you're always like watching and you know people watching essentially yes and watching what happens as you know people nosedive under throughout the night under their own weight of alcohol abuse and whatever the rest of it whatever they've whatever (laughs) else they've chosen to do for themselves oh yeah (laughs) yeah all right so you mentioned in ears we mentioned in ears earlier we talk about in ears all the time you uh, clearly work with many musicians who use in ears uh of the musicians that you work with that you mix their ears, and I, I'm sure there's some who choose to mix their own because you've worked with me, and so I know that you, you know that there's some who choose to mix their own. But what have you learned? Paul Paul went through quite a journey over the last seven and a half years, and I, I think it's fair to say, Paul, that you've finally gotten to a point where you're using ears more regularly than not, but it was a it was a it was a chore for you to get there. Is that right, Paul? It was a real chore. And some of it was not knowing how to use the, the equipment well and several things. And funny thing, I had like a great run of gigs where I was like, well, finally, I figured it out. And then my last gig was not a great experience. And, <laughs> well, that happens. Yeah. 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 So, so have you, what, what have you learned working with people that, you know, for whom you mix ears or even people that mix ears on their own that you've learned tricks and tips that, that, that have worked out for them? Well, your ears are a game of uh game structure. You, you have to have good gain structure to start with. You can't touch the gain once the sound check is over. I don't care what's happening in the room. I don't care whether you don't have groups and you have no way to other, otherwise to get a solo boosted. You do not go after gains if there's ears on stage. So that's thank a, you for saying that. Yeah, by the way, that's the big yeah, but one. that's you. But the the problem that I actually run into is musicians don't do that. Like a guy decides he can't get the he can't get the sound guy's attention. He needs more of him. He'll turn up. Now my in ears, my in ears are are out of whack. Yeah, uh, sometimes greatly, right? And yeah. so yeah, yeah, that sucks. That's, no, everybody should be hands off of gain mm-hmm. post sound check. Mm-hmm. No, but I understand what he's going for. If yeah. if your source gets changed too much, then you end up with the with the, the opposite problem, especially if there's compressors involved, because they end up just splatting the the preamp and the compressor, and yep. then you're just hearing splat, and you're like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, exactly. I mean that's that whole thing is that if you're going for ears, go a lot of guys and uh, a lot of bands will just do a full um, mixer on stage with a split 
snake yes. and they feed the house just inputs that go to just to the house. The house guy mixes just the house. And the house guy can do whatever he wants with yep. gains because yep. it doesn't mess with you. First first band I ever saw do that was Aqueous. And uh, they did that back in like 14 or yeah. maybe even 13. And yeah. I remember being like, oh, wow, that's pretty smart. I don't have to deal with you guys anymore. Now I just like mix the house. And we, and we had we great. had a guy, Dan Meblin, who plays in a band out uh, out West called pop fiction. Mm -hmm. And, and he was the first one that told uh, certainly me, I don't know if Paul, you'd heard about it before, but he was the first one. And as soon as he told me, it was like, <gasps> of course, that's what we should always be doing. Mm -hmm. Like what? Obvious, like isolate us from them, mm -hmm. isolate them from us. Like we're, we're, we know what we want. They know what they want. Yeah. Let it happen. Yeah. Now the, the, the real issue I see with people doing that is they do it for the lowest possible dollar. So they end up showing up with, uh, you know, a, a middle of the road mixer instead of a really nice mixer and a really junky set of splits and yeah. like the cables go bad and they're taping off cables. And it's like, if you're going that route, you do need to spend the money once you need to get a really good split snake. What, what's uh, what, what, do you, what have you seen that you, that you like? I mean, I like whirlwind stuff. I like yeah. Proco stuff. Okay. You know, some of, some of the, some of the people. What was the second brand you mentioned? Pro Proco. Oh yeah. Proco. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so those guys make some of the better, uh, guarantee, you know, lifetime guarantee, yep. you know, cables and stuff like that. And most of the, most of the stuff's all field serviceable. So it's, it's a connector that you can pull apart and you can run a solder gun on and fix it. Whereas a lot of other cables are not that way and therefore you can't fix it ever. Therefore it's just dead. And now you're just putting copper into a landfill to mine more copper out. And then it's like, it's just like, no, 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 buy, buy the cable once yeah. and you'll have a nice thing. And if the band breaks up or you don't need it, it's a nice thing. Somebody's going to want it. You could sell it or nice use it. Thing. Right. If you buy junk, it's garbage the second you buy it. Cause it's never going to retain any value in the used market. So okay. that's the hardest lesson I learned is I bought half my stuff twice because I was like, oh, I need to get this. And now I'm like, no, 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 I need to have, get the right haven't one. Haven't we all? These. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone plays that game. Yeah. But if you're even remotely serious about your band, you want to get ears and you want to get split rig and do all that. Get the right copper, get the right split rig, spend a little Makes more sense. on the mixer. Uh, I'm a big Allen and Heath digital, digital yeah. mixer fan. Yeah. I don't really like the Behringer Midas family of stuff. I don't really like Soundcraft's digitals. Um, yeah. You know, some of Yamaha's stuff is pretty good. The CLs and some of those higher end stuff. But for a small band trying to tour around with their own thing, I tell everyone just get an Allen Heath Q pack that you can yeah. run 38 channels into that thing. Yep. You can run a ton of mixes, a bunch of stereo mixes. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can multi track off it. Uh, the app actually works. You can run like 10 phones on the damn thing. So you can have people locked into their own ear mix, controlling their own mix with Graphic EQ and compressors and all the goodies that a lot of the apps aren't giving you, they're giving you right. some faders to push around, you know, like, yeah. uh, some of the, like the ACE network stuff. It's just, it's no, just like the, fader the, knobs. The stuff. apps that give me the ability, even just to set my own EQ, mm -hmm. the output EQ on a mix, mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference. Because your ears sound the way they sound and the preamps sound the way they sound. You might have to scoop something. I might have to scoop something. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So any other tips for people that you've learned for people using in-ears? Uh, you know, do you I, – I have found in recent years that I – We'll go to the end of the end of the the you know the fader chain and find the engineer's uh, reverb channels and mix those in. Having reverb in my ears makes it feel so much more natural yeah. than that you know than not, which is sort of how a default mix comes. Like mm -hmm. nobody's going to add reverb unless you ask for it. Absolutely. Any anything like that that comes to mind as we're having uh, this conversation. In certain rooms, especially bigger rooms like domier rooms, having verb in your ears is going to mess with you a little bit because okay. you're going to be hearing refraction stuff off the wall that's still hitting your mic and artificial stuff being created in the mixer. That's fair. So I, 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 I'm the same way. I, I give people dry mixes unless they ask for it. Yeah. But what I no, do that's do a is smart way to start. For always sure. Always put up a nice high end condenser. I use I use a ME66 Sennheiser yep. um, shotgun. Put it right on the front of the stage. Point it up. You know, you'll get crowd noise. You'll get room bounce. You'll get dome. That you put that in the guy's ears, and then they hear the room. They hear the naturality of it. Yeah. And it's a lot of ears have little drivers in them that you can bleed the room in. Sure, and this sure. is essentially that. Only it's better because far more control. You're not just hearing drum noise and bounce. Yeah. You're hearing the room bounce and and the crowd, which yeah. you're trying to connect to. So if they're yelling something at you, and you, you want to hear that. You got to pull the ear out yeah. to, to communicate with them. It's like no. no I and, I find putting it extra. I start with for, as far as the drum kit goes, and I'm a drummer. For folks who don't know, I can't imagine that there's people listening who don't know, but maybe they don't. <laughs> uh, 
I I start with overheads. I don't add kick or snare in out of the gate. I'll probably wind up adding a little bit of both of those. I rarely add toms. I even rarely add hi-hat mic. It's the overheads. And it's A, so I can get a picture of what the instrument of the drum set sounds like so that I can balance my own levels. Mm -hmm. But also so that I hear some of that room wash if there's no room mic, you know, because you mm-hmm. like it does pick up, especially between songs, the onstage chatter, some of the chatter from the crowd if they're close enough or loud enough, you know. Yep, yep. So, yeah. Well, the, the other thing that I would say about in ears is um, you're going to get quickly into a situation where you want to over mic everything because you want to be able to have that control. Of course. <laughs> and what you're talking about is is the is the opposite of that, yes. which is to get more of an image. And yeah, absolutely. I think that tactic should be adopted more by drummers because so many guys with in ears don't put, you know, if, especially if they're mixing themselves, don't put a lot of the overheads in and oh. then you just end up having a heavy wrist situation. And, heavy. That's it. Heavy yeah. wrist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I start, I... When I'm building my own ears mix, I take the overheads and put them at Unity, mm. and I mix everything else to that, and rarely does anything else hit Unity, because I don't want to be bashing my mm. kit mm-hmm. for no good reason. Uh, you know, I mean, if somebody mm. tells me to play louder, obviously I have the ability to do that, but yeah. I'd rather hear that than... Th- the trick I always tell engineers, and I know you've heard this from me, is if I'm playing too loud, goose my... Uh, my snare in my ears and self-preservation will fix the problem. Yeah, yeah you know? right, right. <laughs> so, you know. I just started um, last couple of years uh, with Pink Talking Fish, I started doing a ride under. Um, and I, I started doing really? that with Marble Eyes too. Um, and I just, I really like the control for, you know, multi-track mixing and in the bigger rooms, getting that bell every time. Oh. And I and I found right away, you know, Zach from PTF, he loves it. He was like, oh, he's like, what, what's going on with that? And, he, he's like, and now he hits it. He's like, <laughs> you may, may make sure he, he looks at it and interesting you know he wants to hear what i'm getting what mics are you using under the ride uh for a while i was using my earthworks uh sr77s uh or 71s rather um actually no i think they're 77s whatever um sure but i but they're they're so big and they're, they're hard to fly with and hard to tour with so i ended up just putting a my second favorite condenser, which is an uh, AKG 535. Yep. Or uh, it's a C535 EB, technically. Um, but they don't make those anymore. Uh, you got to kind of dig for them online. Uh, I haven't tried the replacement 636 that came out. Okay. Um, but they're basically, a, it's like a jazz condenser vocal. And I love them on anything. I'll put that on a snare. I'll put it on a kick drum, bongos, guitar mic, uh, vocal. I don't care what it is. That mic sounds brilliant on everything. It's got a really good, smooth response. Nice. You don't end up chopping stuff out of it. Yeah. Um, I typically will use that uh, when I do choir stuff because people, oh, that people makes are sense. Sure. all over the place. You don't know what's going to happen. And yeah, you need yeah, it to yeah. just be like good and a little Every, bit sizzly. The listeners all got to hear what all over the place, the, the, the visual, you, you could hear that as, as there was this happening, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have lots of, you know, compression and, and gating and uh, expansion happening here so that we sound like people who belong on the radio, even though we don't. So thank you. I, it, like, uh, this has been amazing. We definitely need, I can't believe it's been seven years and we haven't done this and we're, until now. Uh, so we'll definitely do this again. This is a blast. I, I hope, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Of course. Awesome. Uh, anything else you want to share with, uh, with our audience here before we wrap things up? Um, any questions from you, Paul? Lasting things before last. No, my mind is spinning, man. <laughs> right? I, like, yeah. I I knew that I, my my hope and expectation was that that was what would happen. Is is everybody listening would be like, wait, holy crap! I got to rethink everything about how I approach my live sound or and live production. Really, is what it is because it's a production. Yeah, live yeah. production. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I one one thing I uh, have seen a lot of uh, is is the old school world of sound trusts a certain uh, level of gear, and they they really are very skeptical of a house guy bringing in what I bring in, which is a, a budget mixer and an iPad. And you know, what is your budget mixer? It's a the Allen Heath Q pack. It is the Q pack. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I okay. got three of them, and I love them. <laughs> And That's awesome. so, yeah, I, I got an SQ7, and I got a Q32. Um, it, they're all great mixers, and yep. I've used so many different things over the years. And I just, I find the user user friendliness is important, but the most important thing of live sound is the speed. If you can't get to something fast enough, then you're just leaving feedback in somebody's face. 
and that is never a good thing. So that's why I use what I use because I'm really fast on it. The app is very fast. You can get to where you need to get to yeah. very fast. And some apps will jag and 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 you you, you pull down a slider or an EQ um, slider um, and it'll bounce and right it back up. And it snaps back up. Yeah. I freaking like, hate that. Yeah, yeah. So if it, <laughs> Alan, he fixed that. Like you pull it down and it will send that MIDI address. It'll send that, you know, that command until it's completed. Until, until it gets it the act back. It, it will not kick it back at you. Ah. If if, if if something's really going on with communication, the app will just dump out and it'll make you resign I've seen in. that too. Yeah, you know, which sucks when I'm mixing my own ears oh, yeah. on stage and it's oh, like, yeah. no, I, I had a moment and yeah. now it's gone. Now, now it's gone. Now right. I have to relaunch the app yeah, and yeah, log yeah. in and oh, yeah. change to my mix so that I don't, uh, you know, wind up changing front of house because the engineer hates that yeah. when I change front of house. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, right? Yeah. No, but I, I'd, I'd say the speed speed is everything, you know, like if, if, yeah. you, if you're not, and I, and I would say, extend that to to as so far as the sound check you know like i've seen a big pervasive issue of people don't pull things until they feedback and it's like your job is to ring that out before the artist is on stage so that feedback is near impossible your job is not to just run everything flat and then uh, oh. only cut it when you hear 5k just slam them with the face and had 100 db in front of a 5,000 person crowd and I've seen it a hundred times and I, I just, it, I, it boggles me. Cause I'm like, no, 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 I'm juggling way too much to be fighting feedback in the no, room. You want to deal with live. that ahead of time. Yeah. If feedback yeah. happens Testify. on a show yeah. I'm mixing at something You're really bad is happening. So like yeah. it's, I do my job. I do my job ahead of time. I ring everything dead and if something, yeah, some, I'm really getting my ass handed to me if, if feedback happens at a show that I'm at or the artist is doing something crazy. Sure. Yeah. Something yeah. has changed. Yeah. yeah. Some, something or, or you didn't do your job up front. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. One or the right. other. <laughs> I always say, you know, when I'm doing what I call the Braille mix, which is when we do our own sound at, at gigs and I'm the one that generally in most bands is, you know, the, the, the one that's most comfortable, most knowledgeable with sound is uh, I never let myself have a beer until the system is wrung out because if, if I do invariably, I will stop short and be like, Oh no, that's going to be fine. And by song number three, it has been proven unequivocally that it is not fine. Not fine. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And it's like, no. and then you hate the rest of the night. It's like, no, I've, I've, I learned how to mix from stage when I was in the ride and that was the whole thing. Got it. And, and then I, you know, band didn't, didn't pan out and I had a bunch of gear and I just started getting calls to, to help people out with stuff. And I was like, huh, all right, well, I guess I kind of know how to do this stuff. Yeah. And I never, you know, a lot of people go to concerts and they never think about who's operating these shows. You know, sure. I was definitely one of them. I definitely went to hundreds of shows and I, I would set up and tape right in front of the sound guy, but I don't know, there's some guy over there. He's doing something, you know, obviously, you know, something's happening, of but, course, but you of don't course. like dial into what, what is happening, yeah. what they're going through and like what they're listening for and all these things. I, I, that, I, that was a trip. <laughs> we rehearsed at my house when I was a kid. Cause I was the drummer and that meant the PA was at my house and we could never hear. And anytime anybody turned it up, there was always feedback. And so that is what inspired me and drove me to hang out with every sound engineer we worked with back then and learn from them. It's like, wait, how are you getting the feedback out of this? And they would show me. And, and those were, you know, this was, we're talking about like, you know, the 1990s, maybe even 1980s. So there was no, well, we stuff. had no RTAs though. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you couldn't see it. So you had to learn to hear for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and which is a good skill to have, yeah. but you know, they would show me how they would ring out a PA. I was like, I need to do that at home. So I would go, I went home. I remember the first time I did it. And then we had band practice and everybody's like, Holy crap. And we had a five band EQ on our mixer. It wasn't like this, something. but maybe, you know, made a difference. So, yeah. Sorry. What was that, Paul? I can hear. Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. So I didn't know it could be like this. I didn't. That's what they all said. And then that was the beginning of the, my goal when I join a new band is to not let them know that I know anything about sound. <laughs> and I generally succeed right up until sound check for the first gig, yeah. you know, and if the band's running sound for themselves, unless there's somebody else that already knows what they're doing and then I'll, I'm happy to stay out of it. But if it doesn't sound good, I'm I, you know, it's like, wait, 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 hundred percent. I need to, I, it like, this is our product. Mm -hmm. It's better when we have you there, mm -hmm. but if we don't have you, we got to do it ourselves. And yeah. honestly, you need a fan who 
will be there to give you the honest truth during the yes. show. Be like, hey, this is messed up. Vocals are buried. Guitar is killing. Yep. You know, like just, you know, like step in and help. Because and some, half absolutely. the time they, they're like, oh, they got it. It's fine. This is, they're no. doing their best. It's like, no, no, we need to know. We need to hear yeah. your feedback. Yeah, the, exactly. The most frustrating part about being a sound guy at, at the level I'm currently at, which is, you know, in, in the mids, you know, starting to do some national touring yeah. and my company is relatively successful f for me. It's not a big company. It's just me, but it's keeping food on my plate, you know, um, is, is when you work with a very unprofessional band and they don't know to ask you. And then after the show, they're like, yeah, I just really couldn't hear myself. And you're like, I'm Dude. here for you, man. Like, Dude. would you like fries with that? I can fix any problem as long as you present it to me. Yeah. You know, like if you don't present me the problem, then I assume you're good. Uh, and, and I've definitely heard that a lot. So that's what I would say is don't, don't be shy about telling the sound guy what you want and what you're hearing. If you're hearing feedback, he's probably a hundred feet away and can't necessarily hear what you're hearing right next to you. It's a different um, thing. So, yeah. so that's that whole thing is like, you just learn to speak up. You know, that's the best thing you can do for yourself is be like, Hey, this isn't, this isn't right. Help, help me out. Please like, help. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me help you help me help you, you know? Like, yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it, you're, you're, it's a partnership, right? Yep. Yep. So yeah. Cool. Awesome. Davis, where can people find you if they if they want to at least attempt to get on your schedule and and hire you or even learn from you? Any of those things? Where's the best place for people to find you? Um, and you can, uh, uh, I guess, uh, my, my website is uh, davisthurstonproductions.com. Amazing. Uh, but I also have a Facebook page that I will constantly post uh, streams and bits of video to, so you can watch Great. any of that stuff on my personal Facebook. And it, it I'm, it's. It's littered with video. It, I can I can um, attest to this, folks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I my website's a little old and uh, not necessarily as complete as it could be. I, I got to get to that. That's but the that's the I, truth I, about every every you know solopreneur's website. I've yep. I've never been good at running the business. I'm just good at operating the shows. So right. well, I got know. another show called Business Brain that that we do. That's a that's all about that. So there you go. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm yeah. not good at promotion. I've never really taken out ads. It's all just been word of mouth yeah. all this time. So yeah, that's it's, the, it's, that uh, is the best marketing. If you can get enough work via word of mouth, it, it's going to work the best. Yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm straight out. I mean, I've been booking stuff next December. It's like, it's crazy. Congratulations. That's yeah, great. Man. Crazy. I mean, I, you know, I can't imagine someone would get th to this point in the episode and be surprised by that. Mm. Like you, you know, you, you are a, a student of your craft and, and continually improving. And uh, I mean, like, it's amazing what you've, what you've done. I appreciate awesome. that. Yeah, man. No, it's a pleasure working with you. And <laughs> I appreciate you coming on the show. Paul, you have anything else to add here? No, great interview, Davis. You are the real deal. Thanks for all the insights you shared. I'm sure everybody will enjoy this episode quite a bit. So happy Thanksgiving, guys. Well, happy thank Thanksgiving. You. Thanks for coming on, man. Paul, there is something we say every episode. What I always forget. I, just for this one, get yourself a Davis and always be performing. <laughs>